he's still alive. It's okay. And he's like, but you're only a veterinarian. You're not a surgeon. <laughs> you're like, what is this about? Hello and welcome. You're listening to Paleo Cheese Podcast, Episode 3, Killer Sofa and the Importance of Being a Surgeon. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us again for another amazing episode. I'm Jeremiah Bannister. And I am Chad Lutsky. When we put our powers together, we form Paleo Cheese. <laughs> it's the podcast that tosses film onto that old cheese lounge to question, to analyze, and maybe every once in a while to point and to laugh a little bit, too. And, dude, we're going to actually laugh a lot, I think, today, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think, I think we needed it after last week. <laughs> last week man that was tough wasn't it yeah yeah it was super dupe sad and if people haven't heard it you gotta go back and check it out and and it, at this point look a lot's happened actually between the last episode and this one we're basically all over the place right now we're on what yeah. itunes google play google deezer play, yeah. spotify i didn't even know yeah. that that was something yeah that's pretty awesome <laughs> I, I i've spent many Thousands of hours on Spotify in the last nine years. But, bro, something even more mega dope than that is that we are now officially with the Project Entertainment Network. That's right. Yeah. We are. We are. That, that's pretty good. We got some uh, some people to rub elbows with, various different podcasts you can check out on, uh, on the network. A couple of the ones right off the bat that, that uh, come to mind that I've actually been on are, would be like Staring into the Abyss. Armand Rosamilia's uh, Dead Sexy Armcast podcast. I like that one, man, with the uh, the comedians, the sacred cow. Yeah. I think it's hilarious. I think, there, I think the whole stick is funny where you take a, a show or a movie that is generally very popular and they go after it and just completely ridicule it. There's some really cool shows on there, and it's exciting that we're, we're part of it, man. I mean, we'll, look, we, uh, we're an instant classic. We're an oldie but a goodie, and we just came around already. It's that That's quick. Right. Yeah, it's that quest. Like aged cheese. Paleo <laughs> cheese. <laughs> it is. It's like aged cheese. Exactly. That's exactly how it worked. And people apparently just loved the flavor right away. And so it's been it's been a lot of fun. But the last episode, Paddleton, it was um it was emotional. It's yeah. one of those that that really kind of gives a, it, people a a peek kind of into in, into us, not just as funny guys that like to giggle and laugh and have a good time. But also to, to talk about some serious stuff and even some emotional stuff. Pretty yeah. pretty raw. Yeah, for sure. This week, though, uh, the movie that we chose, because there's not a lot to dissect, um, I brought quite a few things to the table for our little beginning <laughs> discussion. Yeah, <laughs> there's not a lot to dissect. It, it, it's kind of true. I mean, it's like dissecting a ghost a little bit. Well, not, not a ghost. The ghost has some guts on this, but it's there's still but social I, commentary. Yeah, so it's still commentary, and it's gonna be it's gonna be a, a, a knee slap in good time. But man, what have you been? What have you been reading? What have you been up to since we last got on these microphones? Well, uh, last last episode I talked about a Josh Mallerman book that I was reading and I failed to give the title, which is actually a really cool title. And the, the, the name of that book is a house at the bottom of a lake. I gave the publisher, I gave the synopsis, never gave the title. I'm still reading that because I have the tendency to read several different books at the same time, uh, constantly telling myself not to do that, but I do it anyway, but I've been trying to keep it to like a collection of short stories or an anthology and then maybe, uh, you know, a novella or a novel. So I'm not reading like, you know, three or four different novels at the same time. But but yeah, the, that, that was the name of that book. But I'm also, I just started reading uh, uh, a new to me author, um, Ron Rash. He has a collection of short stories called Something Rich and Strange. My friend John Bowden sent it to me maybe like a year or two ago. Uh, John he sends me little care packages, DVDs, buttons, books. He, he really hooks me up, man. Shows me lots of love. And this is one of the books that he, he tossed in a care package. And I put it off for a while and I dug into it. And man, I got to tell you, I, I love it. They're not horror stories, 
but some of the content is dark. And if you have you ever noticed, like if you're watching a horror film, anything goes and you're expecting anything to go. But if you're watching, say, something like a drama or something, and then something dark happens, it hits harder. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of how these stories are. And because uh, it's not labeled horror, the, the cover doesn't look like a horror book or anything. I would I would say it's like a a dark Raymond Carver and a tamer Jack Ketchum, much tamer Jack Ketchum. But man, the guy can write. Uh, he, he he writes what 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 I guess would be called uh, rural noir. And um, I've read the first like five stories. They're great. I can't wait to get back to the next one. When you're talking about, you know, something watching a drama or something that is part of a genre that doesn't necessarily involve really dark elements and you you experience that in real time, not anticipating it, it's, yeah. it can be pretty jolting, man. And I don't I, you know, it's kind of funny. The first thing I thought of and obviously this might be like way out there, but but happy tree friends. Have you ever seen that? No. It's I'm familiar the, with it. Is it a cartoon? It's a cartoon. Yeah, but yeah, it, okay. is, it is really, really, really grody, man. I mean, we're talking <laughs> savage stuff, <laughs> like yeah. way over the line. And you, you watch it and you're like, oh, look at those cute little, oh my gosh. Like, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's so stunning and startling. And, yeah. and so, you know, I'm not anticipating that that's what the book is like, but that extreme. But at the same time, that was, um, I know what you're talking about, you know, where you're you're watching something and then all of a sudden there's an element of that that it really it and it does it punches you hard there's there's yeah. voltage to it when you're not anticipating it a, a weird example also would be my girl if that were a horror movie and Macaulay Culkin died it would be no big deal but it was like a it wasn't like that at all you, you pulled deep he, for that that's a deep one bro yeah 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 that's going old school dude spoiler alert spoiler alert <laughs> yeah yeah you know there's like people out there they're like oh, i hate your guts man i've been wanting to watch that since i was a kid and i never watched it and you ruined it but it's yeah. shocking you know it is. It's, it, it is it's totally shocking not necessarily on a disturbing level like i'm talking about but it is uh, you don't expect it for sure because first of all the the actor is huge at the time and to have a character like that die from, you know, and a, and a child die mm-hmm. from something that's, uh, uh, happens every day. You know, kids get stung by bees all the time and they're fine, but not, not this time. Well, and not only that, but Macaulay Culkin is a vampire. So yes. I mean, he's actually been around for a very long time. Yes. But he, uh, yes, <laughs> covers himself in tomato sauce, goes out at midnight. Uh, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> I've been reading too, man. It's kind of cool, dude. We're, we're, we're on a wavelength, man. We really are. Yeah. It's like it's like Professor X and Jean Grey, you know. Like we're on we're on a thing. We got something going. But the uh, I'm reading short stories too, and I know I don't normally do that. You know, I I don't normally pick something up and go. Oh, I'll go ahead and just read this short story. Yeah. Although I I did mention that I've been reading Hemingway. You know, yep. so that's that's a thing that kind of got me into it. But I, I picked up uh, a couple books. I got a Kafka book, and I haven't started reading him yet. Okay? Okay. But I got Kafka, and then I've got uh, Nikolai Gogol. G O G O L. Anyway, I, I started reading. It's got it's got a, a couple of the stories in here. It's got the nose, which is a savage satire of incompetent bureaucrats and the snobbery and complacency of the Russian upper class. It's got one called Old Fashioned Farmers. Another one called uh, The Tale of How Ivan Ivanovich Quarreled with Ivan. <laughs> I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. Some Russian guy. Yeah, some some Russian guy. The thing is, I'm reading one called The Overcoat. And it's an exceptionally moving tale, considered a masterpiece of the form, about a poor and much ridiculed St. Petersburg official. It's a fascinating read, and actually made me laugh. And I don't do that very often with with books. I'm not gonna lie. You know, there's uh, there's not a lot of books, man, that I'll read and and chuckle out loud and go, "Well, that's kind of funny." Um, but it's also the kind of humor that, oh man, it would be like Office Space, right? It's the kind Mm -hmm. of humor that, um. it doesn't. It, not everybody will find it equally funny. You almost have to know the workplace in order to get some of the jokes in that. Okay. And so you kind of got to know how bureaucracies go and how politicos operate and stuff to really kind of get some of the humor in that. But I also, mm-hmm. I've also been reading this book, and uh, people can't people can't see this sadly, um, but it's a huge, massive book, and it's called the Book of Symbols: Reflections on I- Archetypal Images. I think it's by Tashin here, the last name, T-A-S-C-H-E-N. 
and it's amazing. It's it's uh, just jam packed with all different kinds of images. You've got you know labyrinth, and it'll have a whole layout of what it is, etymo- the etymology of the word, the history of labyrinths. It'll say uh, popular uses of labyrinths in different films or in different stories, uh, the significance of it psychologically in dream states. If there's things that relate to alchemy, it'll be included in it. But, you know, things like drowning, things like medicine, burial, mummies, shape-shifting, uh, transformations, grails, just down the line, hundreds and hundreds. And the book altogether, beautiful art, too, by the way. But the book is about 800 pages long. At the, at the tail end, it's 807. It's a tome. It's huge. Shape-shifting, but, huh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dude. So it's got... All these different, all these different archetypal images, and I like how they pick these these excellent statues or uh, paintings or photos that were taken or sketches, and they they talk about the significance of those, and it's it's just beautifully put together. It's amazing, and and so I've kind of been going through that and uh, learning about different archetypes, man. That's that's interesting, particularly the the shape shifting bit interests me. Did you see Billy Corgan on? The Joe Rogan show? No, and I anticipate doing this. I am, in fact, uh, kind of on some pins and needles. You know, I was more excited to see him on that podcast than I was even to read the article in that cat magazine where Corgan's holding his little kitten. And that was a really big deal for me. I mean, I was looking forward to that for a long time. But the... (laughs) (laughs) But this one is, in all seriousness, you know, this one is... uh, I, I heard about it. I just read about it. What, yesterday? I saw somebody tweet that that happened, and I'm like, mind blown. You know, and so, yeah, I mean, you saw it? I did see it. It was a while ago, but the reason why I brought it up is because he, in all seriousness, claimed that he witnessed someone he knew shapeshift in front of his eyes. Are you serious? Uh, totally, totally serious. You know, it, it's kind of crazy, man. You know, and I don't know what to make of this, but I, I have my cousin used to be a, a missionary down in or my my aunt and uncle and my family. Mm-hmm. They were missionaries down in Mexico and they claimed that, you know, that they'd seen something like that. And I talked to somebody probably oh, a year and a half ago that had also been in places with heavy amounts of witchcraft and stuff like that, that they they said that they had seen that. I, you know, I don't, I don't know what to make of it. I've never seen it. I've never seen a video of it. Yeah. Or anything like that. And it's it's outstanding. It's astounding to even imagine the possibility of this and what it would require of the bones and everything else. But it's amazing that he said that on, on the show. Yeah, yeah. He didn't want to get into it too much. You, you now I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if he, if he talked about it on Howard Stern 2 or if it was Howard Stern first that he talked about it. I can't remember. But he was on uh, Joe... Uh, Rogan for sure too, but uh, yeah, I, I heard him talk about that, and um, he didn't really want to go into detail. And the host did ask him a couple questions, which he answered. But um, you know, I, all of that kind of stuff, shape shifting, ghosts, uh, Bigfoot, um, UFOs. I don't really believe in any of it, but I really, really get excited at the thought of any of it being true and possible. It's exciting to me to know that there might be something out there so whacked out that's true. Mm -hmm. Um, I I like it. I like to, I I like hearing about that kind of stuff, but the shows that they have like ghost hunters or hunting for Bigfoot or whatever, they just seem so hokey. It would be neat to see something that is just a hundred percent legitimate and knowing that what you're watching is totally legit. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I'm, I'm actually with you on this. I've, I've always had kind of a a fascination with the idea of paranormal. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the I, I, I've watched a lot of these shows. In fact, I, my kids were asking me about, I don't know if it was Ghost Hunters or Ghost Lab. I think it may have been Ghost Lab. And they were asking, well, what is this kind of thing? And I was talking to them. And I said, look, man, I have seen so many shows. I watch, you know, I had binge them. I'd go and I'd just watch episode after episode after episode. And I'm thinking, these folks are, are going to the craziest and kookiest places in the world, right? The, the, mm-hmm. the places with, with all the lore and everything else. And, and I said, I've, to this day, there may have been one thing that I've ever, ever seen or heard 
that I thought, man, that would that would spook me, man. And and it's been hard to impossible. In fact, I haven't seen it recreated. Um, and I don't know if it was Ghost Adventures or Ghost Hunters. One of the kind of three younger guys, and one of them's kind of kind of gothy looking, you know, spiky hair, and kind of acts tough and stuff. And you know, they go in. Of course, all the all the different groups, man, they're always turning the lights off, and that's also why I feel like it's a little bit yeah, yeah, yeah. a little like that's that's a, a thing that anybody familiar with the medium of visual stuff like that says, okay, this is a this is a trick. Yeah, this is setting the mood. They're setting the mood. There's no reason. It's not like there's some book that they figured out that, you know what, they come out more if you just turn the lights off, man. <laughs> like, that's just so fake. Yeah. And so they could do that during the day. There'd be no, there should be no reason why, um, or at least with the lights on, there should be no reason why. So that's really an effect for the thrill of the viewer mm -hmm. because it's commercial, you know, and so they're making money. If they don't, they're gone. They're off the show. Yeah. You know, and so there's an element to that that's always kind of bothered me about it but i just you know i stopped watching it a while ago because i just got to the point where i said man i have watched so many hours my life has, has i've dedicated so much time man and every time it's it's over and the best they got are these weird audio clips they're like <laughs> yeah, yeah. and they're like did you hear it said i want to kill you and you're like no yeah. i did not hear yeah. that it i didn't hear of, that it reminds me of the uh the uh in the 80s when they would uh play the back the, you know they they'd convince you the, the <laughs> young listeners that that uh if you played like something like uh, another one bites the dust backwards it would say you know something about you know we all, we all get high on marijuana or kill your parents or something like that and it, it, it is ridiculous and i that one thing that i that i kind of keep turning back to as far as like ghosts go is even in the Bible, there's a scene, and uh, well, not a scene. There's a, a story where um, uh, I think it's Peter and his buddies are out on the boat, and Jesus is walking out there, and they get freaked out, and they're like, "Look, it's a ghost." And I and I always wondered, what was that a problem back then? I mean, you know, he 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 just used the term, and Jesus says, you know, don't be afraid. It's just me. But the fact that 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 he thought it was a ghost it was right. afraid and what, what what does that mean what's there's a history there yes you know and like i and i've wondered too you know and i i'm kind of i'm in a funky place in fact as you were talking man it primed me because i started hearing weird noises behind me and yeah. you know it's a you can see it it's a video you we're looking at each other here but it's so hilarious because i'm sitting there i hear this in this weird noise and i'm thinking dude come on bro this ain't happening <laughs> it's the thing is it's a cat and that but that's how i feel about all of these shows you know what i mean is that i feel like um you know you watch it and then at the end of the day it's like oh, it was a cat you know or, yeah. oh it was you know it was a, a stick or there was nothing there or it was a bunch of static and, and everything you know i there was a weird situation my my um, relatives in Spain. I had relatives in Spain, and they they had a cat, and there was this situation where apparently an individual was cursing them or whatever, and the cat jumped out of a window and impaled itself, and it sounded pretty wild to hear. And I thought, well, that sounds absurd. The only thing is, man, is they were like for real crying. Like, I mean, it was like a really traumatic thing for the whole family. They said it jumped through a window. They're like, look, this was. The cat was like, like freaking out, uh, hissing at everything, running all over, insane, and then just whoop and jumped right out of a window. Dude, that's creepy. And died. And I'm like, so even if it wasn't a curse, you have a crazy freaking cat, right? Like, <laughs> imagine just being in the house with that thing, and just wow, and just going all over, and you're trying, you're you're trying to help it. You know, I mean, there's probably different kinds of mental disturbances that even cats experience. But I mean, <laughs> dude, I said, it, was a it was a shapeshifter. Is a shape shift. <laughs> oh. Other than you know, ghost shows that you used to watch. You've been watching anything recently? Oh man! Well, yes, dude. I'll tell you. David Lynch, man, is a hell of a drug. Not gonna lie. It's one of these <laughs> things, dude, where you get into you get into this thing where you you stumble on somebody that you've never seen before. You know, a director yeah. or a band. You know, a lot of times it happens with music. Um, and, and so I was like, man, I really gotta, I gotta go and I gotta, I gotta check out more of this, this Lynch stuff. And I watched Eraserhead 
it was the most bizarre thing that I had ever actually seen. I, I, I thought to myself, this is insane. And I, it, it was, <laughs> it's funny because we, we talked and we brought up Lynch and I was like, Oh, it's the, you, you said it's the guy who did a racer head. And I said, Oh, maybe we could do that. And you said, no, no, no. You know, that's uh, a lot of people have done that. And I, I mean, I can imagine us having a good time with that, but that yeah, is so, sure. it's so bizarre. So yeah. strange, dude. But it got me, it got me thinking, you know, like what was in his brain you know, when he was doing this, like, obviously he had to pitch it. And I, and I read, I read him on it. You know, I have, I have that Lynch on Lynch book that I've mentioned. So I'm reading, you know, up as I'm kind of watching his stuff, but, but I started thinking like, well, what was in his brain? What was in his mind? And he's real, he's really elusive. So he doesn't like talking yeah. about, he doesn't like giving anything away. Like what was the animal or was it an animal? Was it a puppet? Was it robotic? Did they use his skin like they did with E.T. or Dumbo Drop? You're talking about you know, the baby. The baby, yeah. The yeah. baby in Eraser Head is, is a mystery, and people want to know. Mm-hmm. And there, there's questions as to whether it's it's uh, a baby cow, if it was an alien. You know? <laughs> there's like, And he won't talk about it. But and So I was like, okay, well, I don't know what's in his brain. But, I, but it got me interested in saying, okay, what kind of weird genre is this? You know, like what? What is this kind of thing? And and I I stumbled on experimental films and surreal experimental films. And dude, bro, we're talking weirdos, dude. Like, I mean, I <laughs> I, I I have tried. I, there's actually a playlist on YouTube that if you look it up, experimental surreal films or something like that. It's like 509 of these things, and I think some are repeated, you know. Um, but it's still a lot. But I I watched three of them. One of them was called The Love of Zero, and that's by Robert Flory. Has a, I don't even know why I wrote this down. I wrote who, who played the guitar and who played the piano. Um, they're long gone by now. This is an old film, very old. Um, but the thing is, is that maybe it was as a warning that if they were somehow still alive, you know, you may not want to hire them. <laughs> They're really bad. It was the worst. Some of the, I thought it would be the worst music I'd ever heard. I'm like, this is so terrible, and they did it on purpose, you know. And I, I said, man, it's some avant garde stuff, man. I don't know what is happening with this. You know, what are they doing to us? Um, some kind of you know conspiracy going on. Obviously, some kind of MK Ultra. <laughs> I don't know what this is. So then, I, but then I watched this other one. And it's like it's like the the film of the future or something like that. Nineteen eleven, Anton uh, Giulio, uh, and so it's got these these uh, these scenes and it's just bizarre. And it, it actually, I mean, it's kind of cool in a way. Um, it was better than the zero one. Like I felt that I, I liked the still images in it. There was a lot of these. Um, there, there was a lot of these photographs of people moving their body or moving their head in ways that that warped their face and their body motions and stuff. And so it was pretty cool. You know, it's cutting edge for the time. But, bro, the music, yeah. every time I'm like, what are these people smoking? This guy, the, the, the person in the background, you had this music playing, and there's a person going like, <laughs> like the whole time. And I'm thinking, dude, be quiet. I'm trying to watch this. <laughs> like, what, is, what is wrong with these people? And the last one was this, this Dada filmmaker, it was a film study, 1926. Uh, uh, a Dada filmmaker, Hans Richter. It's an early short. There's a lot of random imagery from the description. It talks about floating eyeballs and and all of this. And dude, it was so funny um, because it, it, and I'll just I'll quote one one comment out of this YouTube thing, and, and it's a comment actually under the uh, the love of zero. There was a person, the, the most uh, one of the most liked comments was by Asada Creed, and it said. I don't get it too much for me. And there was a person named Armin Akvan from three years ago. And dude, it cracked me up. I'm like, this, this sums it all up. It said, never say such a thing. Sometimes even the artist himself does not know what his mind is trying to say exactly. And sometimes you may need a, a little experience and knowledge about a genre or art history to get the meaning of some elements, but it's never impossible for someone to understand. Uh, it can be, it, the artist's fault that his art can't communicate with people. Um, that is garbage. <laughs> I, I, I said, no, no, no. And coincidentally, and people liked this this comment. There was four upvotes. And, you know, I'm going to downvote that right now. Dislike that. That is not true. You're lying. <laughs> I'm doing it in real time. Because see, here's the thing. 
that person could say that and be like, no, nah, man, you need to have experience with like magically seeing things that aren't there and all that. And you got to feel it, man, to like, no, well then tell us, oh, I'm not going to do that. Of course you're not going to do that. Cause you can't man, because that is, that is hot trash. That is bad film. <laughs> that is super terrible. And that's what it is, man. And so I, but, but I, I have this weird addiction now. And so I'm watching these things, Chad, and maybe it's masochistic. You know, maybe it's like I want the pain a little, the mm. suffering of watching these films. But I, I, I have an idea where I, I might have my kids watch them or my wife and just record their reactions in real time and then and then publish it and and do it under the guise that we're trying to become cultured. Because these are hoity-toity rich people do that do this. And that are like, oh, man, did you see that recent cutting edge film by blah, blah? And I'm like, bro, I did. And it is garbage. <laughs> like, it is terrible. <laughs> so, but that's so Eraserhead. Eraserhead, though, is not terrible. Eraserhead is good. No. Yeah. Eraserhead it's, it's, is good. It's, a love it. <clears throat> it's kind of a love it or hate it. There's there's not a yeah. lot of in between with that one. But <laughs> so what have you been watching? I mean, it, you know, I can't imagine you've been watching the same kind of weird experimental films that I have. No, I, I've been watching much more mainstream things, yeah. actually. Um, Better Call Saul. Years ago, along with everybody else, my wife and I uh, watched Breaking Bad, all like five seasons of it, and loved it. And then Better Call Saul came up, but we didn't pay a lot of attention to it. So recently we we started. I think we're on the second or third season. And it's good. I mean, it. it, it uh, I love the characters, the acting, you know. It's not Breaking Bad by any means. It's not as good, but it's a great show, Better Call Saul. And it's funny because my, you know, we're all doing the whole uh, jolly good time quarantine thing. Uh, and my son, my, my youngest, the only child of mine who lives still lives at home, he's 15. And he had, uh, I think he had just got done watching Walking Dead. <clears throat> and there were no more seasons available for him to check it out on, on Netflix. So he was looking for a new show. And I said, well, why don't you try Breaking Bad? And, and my son, Nakota, he is kind of uh, picky sometimes with with different things. He's not quite as open-minded. as uh, He's probably more open-minded than, than me at his age. But he will pass judgment on something before seeing it. Or, or maybe it's just, he doesn't trust me if I try to turn him on to some music or, or a movie or a show, but it didn't take me long, too long to convince him to watch breaking bad. I, I asked him if he knew what it was about and I can't remember the answer he gave me, but he, but it was funny. And so he watched it and because he has so much free time on his hands right now, he binged it for several days in a row and I think it only took him less than two weeks to get through all five seasons of the show. Wow. And, uh, yeah. Um, and we just kind of let him do that. We don't really don't let him sit in front of the TV that, that much, but under the circumstances. So, uh, you know, escape was, is and whatever. Plus he's learning how to cook good meth, you know? Yeah. And you guys are from Battle Creek, and so you really do have to learn that. I mean, that's like one of the yeah. major exports of the city, right? I mean, they used to be it's Kellogg's. A, it's, yeah. it's a prerequisite, really. Yeah, a prerequisite, yep. For, you Some know, crank. if you want to get anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, he, he uh, yeah, no, next week he's going to learn, he's going to watch Weeds. Yeah. And yeah. then. Uh, he has to be a well-rounded we'll, drug manufacturer. Yeah, yeah. Has, and yeah, then we'll turn be well to, rounded. Some, and then we'll turn them on to some good old, uh, you know, like Prison Break, Oz, yeah, stuff like that. And eventually, Prison he's going to have to be on uh, Fear and Loathing. He's going to have to do a little bit of Fear yeah. and Loathing in Las Vegas. In Las Vegas, you got the Ether, the Mescaline, you know. So I mean, they're just all very well rounded, very well rounded. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pre-prison shows, <laughs> prison shows, post-prison shows. Yes, yeah. you know this is your life. Anyway, <laughs> uh, what, what's the reason why I really I bring it up is is his his inability to I guess trust me uh, with things, and it's funny because he used to be a real horror movie nut, and when he was growing up, he would always beg me to let him watch horror movies. I mean, from the age of like five. And I'd be like, no, you can't, you know, 
And then I, I don't remember how old he was. I finally we finally watched. I think it was like Bride of Frankenstein or Frankenstein or actually I think it was a Creature from the Black Lagoon. And you know by this time the kid is. I, I don't remember how old he was. Maybe he was like six or seven or something like that. And by this time, just because of the world that we live in, kids are desensitized. There's nothing frightening about Frankenstein. Like it used to be right. when it came out in 32, you know, when they were yeah, yeah. going to the theater and seeing it was freaking people out. It's hard to imagine that because yeah. it's so not scary. But uh, kids are, they're born desensitized. So, you know, I weaned him a little bit on horror and I would let him watch some things. I think by the time he was 12, we watched the first Halloween, which he laughed all the way through. It's one of my favorite slashers, uh, one of my probably top 10, 15 horror movies of all time. And he ruined it for me by laughing at all the parts that are supposed to be scary. So anyway, for the next, you know, uh, f- three two, three years, I, I turned him on to different horror, horror movies. Um, and I kept him away from anything that was just really dark and disturbing where you feel like you need to shower after and, and you feel like, man, I wish I kind of wouldn't have watched that. That messed me up psychologically. I kept him from stuff like that. Like Holy we had Mountain. Some fun. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you were talking about that the other day, but yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, no, no. No, I was talking 120 Days of Sodom. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, we no. that. But he was eight. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> right. Yeah, no. Yeah. No, we, uh, but we had some fun, you know, like Evil Dead. I, uh, we watched that, but I kind of, I, I did it backwards. Um, we watched Army of Darkness first and then like Evil Dead 2, I think, and then Evil Dead. It was kind of a, a weaning process of the Sam Raimi films, even though Evil Dead was, you know, far superior than, than any of them. And, But anyway, then come last year, he's almost 15, and he's always like, why don't you give me a scary movie to watch? And and I have turned him on to some scary movies that that he thought were scary, like The Grudge. But then I said, okay, I got a movie for you. Uh, It's called Hereditary. And uh, he's like, okay. So he watched it, and he was pretty horrified. And uh, he watched it with a friend of his, and he's one of these kids who he he's scared stiff and screaming, but he's having a blast while he's yeah, doing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? He's not like, I need to sleep with you guys for another year, you know, every night, and now I need therapy yeah. or anything like that. <laughs> I need um, therapy. <laughs> but now, oh. ever since then, he's just, he doesn't like horror movies anymore. I, I don't know, with the exception of like The Walking Dead. Which I don't necessarily consider horror. It's more like a, a, this survival adventure. Yeah, drama, survival you know? suspense or something, you know, because there are pretty yeah. tense moments. Yeah, yeah. sure. But yeah, but I, I, I don't think anybody really finds it scary. Yeah, like it, it's more like thrills and in, 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 you know, survival adventure, whatever. But ever since he saw Hereditary, apparently that elevated horror film mm-hmm. has elevated his interest to where. Now he's th- that's the pinnacle for him. He's ascended that the height, the, Chad. It's over. It's he, done. He, he, he has seen the, yeah. <laughs> he's been bathed in the light of horror, and it only goes downhill from here. Yeah. And yeah. so he thinks nothing can hold up to it. So therefore, he's just not interested. That's the end of it, man. So, it's over. Yeah. And forever. There were a couple times I was like, hey, you want to watch this? And, and he's like, now. And finally, one day I said, you know, Nakota. If you're scared now, it's okay, buddy. You know, I'm not going to make fun of you or whatever. If you, you're just not, he's like, Dad, I'm not scared. It's like, there's just not going to be a movie as good as Hereditary. And it is a good movie. It is in my top probably two, three horror, scariest horror movies of all time for sure. Top two for sure. But there's well, come a lot on, of good man. movies out there he's well, missing on, out man. on, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now that doesn't see, mean. Maybe, <clears throat> It doesn't mean you got to go back to like Children of, of the Corn. You know what I mean? Like th- that. I think there are some films, man. Like I, I was showing, I was going through old ones, and I think you know, I was showing the kids in old uh, clips from old ones or something like that, and they did want to see some of them. But it was also that I think that we live in a day and age that because of the development and the the progress that's happened with special effects and stuff like that, that um when you see something that's just really really fake that it's easy 
to just go, well, that looked fake or, oh, that's not real, you know. And and yeah. so now there are some genres, like, you know, take, for example, Doctor Who. Doctor Who gets away with that. You know, Doctor Who sometimes has decent effects and everything. The the graphics on it, it's not it's not that impressive. And they kind of do it a little bit on, on purpose. There's a history of that, you know. And but they seem to be able to get away with it. But it, I wonder if if horror is something a little bit different. That there is an expectation that if somebody is going to, you know, look like they're a zombie, they shouldn't look like claymation. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> yeah. you, you can't get away with that anymore. You know the 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 noise, the crank noise. Like, if if somebody's turning their head around, you know, where it, it doesn't sound like a crank, it sounds like more like broken bones or something. You know, the, yeah. there's an there's an anticipation, and I think maybe what ruined them in is that whole Five Nights at Freddy game, dude. It's they, they watched five they, they they played Five Nights at Freddy's and bada boom bada bing, dude. They're not they're not as scared anymore because they were terrified by that game and they yeah. loved it. They loved being my kids were. You know, my kids loved playing Five Nights at Freddy's, and I didn't. I didn't get it at first. I'm like, "Oh, come on, man! You know, like, why you guys? You guys this is ridiculous, kind of thing." And so one time I played it, and they were like, "You got to play it in the dark." You know, I'm like, "Whatever." So I played it in the dark, man, by myself. And dude, it, took, it didn't take very long, man. I was kind of getting a little nervous, hearing noises. I'm like looking around a little bit in the dark by myself, and I'm thinking it'd be nice if one of the kids was down here with me. <laughs> and then, and, then yeah. and it came out at me, and I I practically pooped my pants a little bit. And so I, it was. I said, I'm done with that, you know. But so I can understand how y- a younger generation of people can watch stuff that we thought was really scary and just not be yeah. scared by it. Yeah. Yeah. Now this movie we watched this this week might be different. They might be terrified by that. <laughs> you know, I I I asked Nakota several times. I showed him the trailer, yeah. and he just laughed and said, "I am not watching that trash with you." <laughs> <laughs> he would not do it. I was like, "Come on, we can laugh at it together." Mm-hmm. And uh, so, are, are we ready to dive in? I've got, dude. I've got my my lazy boy. You know, I've got my little thing of cookies here next to me and my warm milk, and I'm ready to get into this movie, bro. Sounds good, man. Yeah. Well, I'll, uh, let's kick back and uh, let's talk about it. Let's do this. So this film, dude. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> Killer Sofa, We, yeah. I guess we should, we should talk about how we found it. We were mm-hmm. looking for something to kind of like, you know, Sometimes if you watch something dark and disturbing or whatever at night and uh, you need that kind of like, I need to take a shower right here in bed to, to cleanse the uh, evil off and, the, and the, <laughs> yeah. the impending mental illness PTSD that is trying to creep within my psyche after watching this film, you'll put on something like Family Guy or, 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 or any kind of cartoon or whatever. And this was our, uh, this is our cleansing of the Paddleton so to speak. And so we, we knew we wanted to find something that kind of spoke to us as film lovers, film viewers. You know, we had the, the, um, the indie artsy kind of uh, David Lynch thing. And then the serious, like uh, mumble core um, dramedy with, that was Paddleton. And now we're just having some fun. That's like, uh, you know, I mean, who doesn't, well, I guess there are people out there that don't like to laugh at movies that, they don't realize they're supposed to laugh at. I mean, this is what this was made for. Yeah, yeah, comedic and horror. So, yeah, we searched on. We searched around for trailers and, and saw some some uh, some ones that we found interesting, and we decided to to go with Killer Sofa. And I think it was because while the premise was absolutely uh, ridiculous, the we could tell that the film itself wasn't your average B movie. The quality. Which is different, and so uh, we chose Killer Sofa. Yeah, it was it's a better a, pick than Sharknado, I think, bro. Oh, I, yeah, I didn't yeah. want to do that. You, now you've actually seen Sharknado, though, haven't you? Yeah. You <laughs> see, I haven't. I, I've never seen. It. And we, but we did see there were some other ones. There was Contenders, dude. In this, there was there was Velocipaster. Wasn't that what it's called? Yeah, yeah. That's that's. I, I'm still <laughs> down. I'm still down with. <laughs> Checking that out. That was uh, that's pretty oh, hilarious. Oh, yeah. So there was Velocipaster, and then and then I saw one. Was it called Man Poseidon Rex? It was that was, 
it was just almost too stupid. Like it wasn't just yeah. stupid, you know, where it's like a dinosaur in the oceans, like rawr, coming at people. But it was the CG, the CGI stuff, man. It was just so bad. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so it was just, it was a really terrible uh, alternative to this. And this one, I think that Killer Sofa had an awesome trailer. I mean, it, it was funny, and yeah. yet it it seemed from the trailer anyway. It seemed as if the acting wasn't the worst in the world, and it seemed as if the the cinematography was good, like the the lighting and the angles and the way the camera moved and stuff. It seemed like it was pretty good. And I said, "Whoa!" I said, "This this actually looks entertaining." And the idea of a killer sofa, you know, I thought that was kind of a fun yeah. thing, which is not a sofa at yeah. all. It's a recliner. <laughs> it's a recliner. It's a lazy. Which, one. I, I don't know if that was done on purpose, just to kind of like poke even more fun, or unless. In New Zealand, that is a sofa. I don't know. The The movie was uh, written and directed by um, Bernie Rao. Bernie Rao. And he's he's done a lot of short films. And he's also done uh, at least one other feature film. As far as I know, uh, the actors and actresses are, I wouldn't call them nobodies. I don't know what they've done, but but I haven't seen them in anything before. The main the main character, I went to, but, I went to IMDb so, and there was like nothing. Yeah, that's a shame. She wasn't horrible. Francesca? Okay, so we're watching Killer Sofa, okay? And within that first 10 minutes, what are you thinking? What are you, you know, what, what, what's, what are your thoughts? Well, I, for one, right out of the gate, th- th- you know, this dude, it was kind of messed up because he looks like he's in some weird trance, you know? He, he's obviously doing something cultic, right? Real bona fide weirdo. I mean, if you walked in on this particular thing this guy was doing, you'd be like, bro, you, you call 911 like immediately and you need some help. A lot of meds, but he, he looks like he's bleeding. Like he cut his hand and he, and it's like kind of dripping blood over top of a picture of this, you know, attractive woman. Um, and, and his eyes look all trance like, like, he's kind of mumbling something. You know, and uh, of course the trance. <laughs> so, so it's what he's got going on. And then the next scene, somehow he's tied up, and there's a dude behind this this uh, this curtain kind of thing. You know, and you can see the the outline of him, the silhouette, and he looks like he's got something. Almost, it almost to me when I first saw it, it looked like he had a very large hypodermic needle. That's what mm-hmm. I thought. And then he and then he comes through, and he comes he comes through this little uh, thing there, and He's holding a, a saw. It's one of those little saws that vibrates really fast to cut through stuff. And the dude yeah. who was in the trance, he's now tied up and he's gagged with this this bandana. And you're thinking, it confused me, actually, because I'm thinking it, it leapt from yeah. him doing that that weird culty thing to him being tied up. And I'm like, how did this happen? What's up with that? Right. And, I, and I immediately had to kind of put it together and say, well, he had to have done it on purpose. You know, there had to be something involved in this that he was he was either manipulated to do this or he willingly did this. And then the guy just cuts his leg off. Now, it doesn't show it doesn't show the the leg getting sawed. Right. It's not that macabre, but it blood and stuff like that. And you kind of see it and everything. And that's the beginning of the film. You know, so I mean, it was it was weird right out right out of the gate. Um, Yeah. yeah. That that particular scene, uh, I was confused. And, and once you get to the end and you think about, okay, this is what was really going on, but it because it was a low budget movie, yeah. I didn't know what to expect. And I thought, okay, we've got a, we've got a, a, a missing piece already here that, that is on a cutting room floor somewhere that we don't know what the heck is going on. And so I thought it was just bad writing, but I was actually really disappointed that they didn't show, because a lot of these low budget films like these horror ones the leg especially trauma they will show everything <laughs> no you know? no you were disappointed <laughs> i was <laughs> they were, they're often unrated oh, no. um, which is essentially like rated x but yeah they, 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 he puts the saw up there i was like here we go no. and it just showed blood splattering on a thing and then a yeah. chunk of meat and I was like, oh, at least we got that little chunk of meat that went flying through the Shit. air. <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine the pouty lip on your face when you thought you're like, dude, you've let me down already. <laughs> you know, like, I, I did. I said it out loud. I was watching with my wife, and I was like, they didn't show it. <laughs> <laughs> so it was weird because 
it was so frustrating at the very beginning to see, to feel like something was missing or that I, why is it, it seems where, how did he go from one thing to the next so quickly? It didn't show him stand up after the weird cultic thing and then walk and tie himself up. But you kind of, in a way that does come around full circle at the end to really make sense. If you can say that as to why, and if they would have put too much in there, it may have betrayed that. And so, yeah, I think that it's one of those things that, yeah, at first I would have chalked it up as a negative and it may still be, I guess, but having finished and completed the movie joyfully, in fact, I, I, I didn't have a, it was entertaining. I, I said, well, I can, I watched the whole thing. And so, you know, it, by the end I said, oh, well now that makes sense. So yeah, yeah. it really is one of those that you do have to watch it to the end to make sense out of the beginning. And then it didn't take long. You started to get this this um, uh, this feel for kind of where it was going and like what would be included. Not just that it was it was kind of deranged and culty feeling and stuff with the the weird ritual, and then it involved obviously some chick and this guy. Right? He obviously was real creepy fanatic for her type thing. Um, and but that you know and that he was going to get his leg cut off for whatever reason, whatever that was all about. Um, that. It didn't take long before you you realize that something's up with this cow or this 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 lazy boy, right? This the mm-hmm. sofa was well, you know the killer sofa, yeah. because they they go into this what, what appears like either a garage or some kind of uh, storage unit, and these people come into the storage unit and they go back there and it's it's already creepy. I mean it's like surrounded by candles and skulls and stuff, and there's weird kind of smoke around it, but the the, the couch is propped up like almost like straight, like it's, it's standing upright. And it's got chains on it. It's bound. bound it's, it's, it's bound by chains, like Hannibal Lecter or something. Yeah, it's bound. And and it there's an injury involved right from the beginning with this thing, and it almost takes off a finger. That scene made up for the lack of gore in the first one. Because oh, yeah. it did it did show it. It showed it was like yeah. this finger, this knuckle getting it was cut hardcore. through. It was gross, man. Yeah. yeah. And and so so, you know, this this couch, obviously, people, you know, the idea is it's dangerous and it says bring to Francesca and you you um, they then show Francesca. It kind of does the soap opera thing where it, it foreshadows the very next thing that's going to happen. It brings up the name and then it shows the person and she's like a, a ballet slash interpretive dancer. And she's got this music group that's singing and playing music that reminds me and I'm not meaning to dog anybody. Uh, on this but it is you know, people will know what i mean it's kind of like a, a very low low talent worship team that is playing music and it's it's there's they have the the lineup you know of the the guitarist and the bassist and the guy singing on the microphone but he kind of came off like more like a wedding singer than a worship singer mm-hmm. like a low and i and i again i don't mean to be rude but the 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 guy, his voice, it was so terrible, and it was this real messed up song that was about obsession, kind of, and it was, the lyrics were bizarre, and she's doing this dance that she's not really that, I don't even know if she was a ballet dancer. I'd be interested to interview her one day, just to say, did you do any ballet before you did this? Maybe I, she was a, a mime or like some kind of uh, part of one of those interpretive prophetic dance troops or something, but not ballet, I don't think. I got the impression that while that scene was happening, that it wasn't written in. And then they found out, she's like, you know, you guys, I used to take ballet classes like 15 years ago. And the director's like, okay, we're going to have you dancing over here. And so she tried her old moves that she used to know. And (laughs) and they wrote that in. And they they were like, well, we have to have somebody. Does anybody know how to play an instrument? And they just had this gaggle of people. They were like, oh, I play guitar. I play bass. And they brought them together. And they're like, well, does anybody sing? And this one guy's like, he's got like the secret persona, you know, that he goes out at night to these jazz lounges or something. And he sings these really weird songs that that's the guy's like, I know how to do it. I'm the man. I can do this. So he goes out and he's singing it. And it's just very bizarre. Um, And it's kind of like... um, it's it's a heightened version. Her dancing is like a heightened version of what Napoleon does in Napoleon Dynamite when he's he's dancing to oh that song that's, that's playing. Not the dance, but the one where he's doing the interpretive stuff where he, he kind of folds his hands together and it's, yeah, it's yeah, the yeah. butterfly thing. In the classroom. Yeah. In the classroom. It's like that, but just kind of spiced up a little bit, you know, with a little bit more dance moves, 
So, you know, but apparently people are just goo goo gaga for her. And that I think even the singer, the way he was into it, I mean, he was like almost like singing from his heart to her or something. Um, That's foreshadowing, too, I guess. Yeah. (laughs) Because uh, that, that plays into it later. Yeah. So you get that from pretty soon where there's you start to see the the weirdness and the the these detectives come in and stuff and start asking her questions. And apparently somebody died, you know, there was uh, or they, they were wondering about it and said, well, we found his foot and they did show that. I mean, that was pretty nasty, yeah. dude. It was blue yeah, and well. all it was. It did not look like a clean cut. It looked very jaggedy. <laughs> like, did, so you, you definitely they... got your dopamine released from that. Yeah, <laughs> and then you've got your uh, your hippie uh, fishing boat captain rabbi. <laughs> you don't know he's a rabbi though till later. No, you have no yeah, idea. There's nothing know. that points toward that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. He he looks like he should be uh, selling fish on a or uh, you know out on a boat six months out of the year. <laughs> and he's got like the Native American. Uh, it, it looks like a pouch, you know. I, I've been to I've been to different events and stuff. We have friends who are Native American. We've been to powwows and stuff like that. And so, like, but he has like a pouch. So I thought maybe he was Native American at first. I thought that's kind of what they were implying. And he's got he's kind of a magical man, right? Shamanistic. He he. Uh, they bring the the sofa, and it's it's in this cage like a dog cage, but it's big made for this sofa. So again, it's a guarded sofa and he's kind of looking at it and, and looks in the face. And by the way, we got to make this real clear. The sofa looks like a person. Cause it's got the two, it's got the, the two um, back parts, you know, the cushions for the top back and the lower back, but the top has two buttons that look like eyes and there are no buttons on the bottom part or else you'd lose the, the effect of this. So there's only yeah. two, two in the top that look like a, an eyes and so the bottom crease for, you know, where you have the bottom cushion for the back, it looks like where the mouth would be. And it's hilarious. Mm-hmm. It works. I, I said, whoever yeah. thought of that's pretty creative. But the dude puts his hands on the couch real slowly and magically, you know, and he, and he puts them on there. And next thing you know, he's kind of shaking, blah, 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 kind of doing that thing. And he, um, he sees into the d- distant past. And there's this real messed up scene of somebody running and trying to get away and, and all this. And next thing you know, he's on the ground and he had apparently passed out or whatever and yeah. gets up and he, apparently he's got the gift. <laughs> yeah. The gift that yeah. his elder uh, rabbi father had. And I, I take it they're like mediums. So what, what's so funny is that they established this character as someone um, – that the audience, I guess, is at, at this point is supposed to be rooting for so that he can show his dad yeah. that he's got what it takes to do whatever it is. We don't know, but that he's got what it takes to do it. And he's and in he his 60s. His dad. Yeah, I, I think my favorite character, um, one of the funniest ones to, to point and laugh at, I guess, would be TJ, because this was supposed to be Francesca's boyfriend. But yet, Maxi kept saying he was gay, and there was no real, like, love, like, between them. He, there was, he was none. She, she, she referred to him as her partner, mm-hmm. and uh, Maxi would just say, yeah, he's gay. So, when he got his eyeballs and brains sucked out through the vacuum cleaner, he he's leaving a message for her somehow, for, for some reason. And even when he, uh, before that, when he got his... Uh, attacked by the chair and it sliced mm-hmm. up his leg for some reason instead of going to his mom's house who happened to live three houses down instead of going to his mom's instead of calling 911 he calls his girlfriend who he has obviously no affection for whatsoever i mean they mm-hmm. don't, don't hate each other yeah. there's just nothing there nothing yeah. at all and so he chooses to call her and in the meantime goes sits goes and sits in, in the, the bathtub tub. yeah i don't know why in the tub, and she, and then she like comes in, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. And she comes in, and he's like, Ugh! and he's crying, you know, and his leg is sticking you, out of the tub and it's looking all gnarly. Uh, Mary pointed something out in that scene that I didn't notice and I had to rewind it. And sure enough, when he, when they walk into the house and they hear him moaning and, and crying, that it's all looped again. So when they go, <laughs> when they go in there, they see him, yeah. it's like looped. It's hilarious. The same exact thing. Wow. Yes. 
same moans. It's hilarious. Dude, that's hilarious, man. And so, like, yeah, so the boyfriend was weird. Okay, so going back to the the Native American Jewish shaman rabbi guy, the mm-hmm. he um everything was either through the magic, you know, that he saw something and was piecing it together, or it was his investigative stuff that you know or his dad's ability to do it where his dad was talking on the phone and kind of telling you never see the dad other than in a picture and yeah. the dad is like look you don't have the gift and he's really shooting him down the whole time and there's never any resolution on this by the way it's not it never it never like resolves where the dad is like and you know what you have the gift like it never yeah. turns into that <laughs> yeah, right and so he's he's vying for the the approval of a father that in the end is just it's an absent it, very very loose end apparently um but they they ran out of budget. That's why they just used the photograph. They couldn't the afford photograph. to pay another actor. <laughs> and so, like, it's either through this guy that's just not there, or it's through the journalistic efforts. And by journalistic efforts, I mean finding these websites that, you know, I know these kind of sites exist, where you go and you can you can go to these websites where they're, let's say they they say you know I've really had experiences with vampires, you know, like I survived vampire attack. And yeah. they're a news, a quote unquote news outlet that writes and, and talks about this stuff from a perspective that says it's real, you know, and that they all have these magical insights into things um, that somehow they know about. Like this guy, he's doing, it almost looks like a webinar that you would pay for mm-hmm. that he would say, well, yeah. these, for my patrons, <laughs> if you're a patron, you get to see this first. And it's a webinar on the Dubuk. And he's like, look, the Dubuk is. Uh, a demon that's you don't want to interrupt its feeding that can go very badly for you and he's looking super magical himself he even has this this uh, elongated wand that is hilarious and is kind of you know is bald and he's looking very almost it looks like he could get away with having the the raleigh finger mustache the yeah. swirly swirl mustache you know and so he's doing that but that that's how you get the information all the time and it was hilarious dude one of my favorite one of my favorite scenes was where they're they're talking in the house so you've got sister cleo you've got jewish rabbi shaman guy and you've got maxi and they're in the house and they figured out together the the grandfather and his girlfriend they figured out that um uh, it's demonically possessed okay and that it's a soul eater and they figured it out and it's funny because Maxi, after he's, they're like, look, it, it, this is what it really is, and the the chair is actually possessed, and that's why it's doing all of this stuff and and everything. And she kind of puts her head down, and he's like, Maxi, like, come on, you have to believe me. And she goes, I knew it from the very moment I saw it, like, <laughs> and it was very, <laughs> it was very matter of factly about all this, and it reminded me of this old, this old video, not super old. I mean, it's maybe like five years ago or something, but there was a, a news station in Pennsylvania. I think it was York County, and they they did this investigation where they went to this house that was supposedly haunted, and the news reporters and the the cameraman were walking around the house and letting the woman give tours of it and stuff. And the guy was like, "Ouch, something in my arm." And she goes, "The lady from the house is like, oh, you got a scratch, didn't you? They're really upset that you're here recording." I'm thinking, lady, how would you know that? Like, did they whisper to you and say, they better not record? Like, where did you get this? <laughs> and then on top of it all, she 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 stuck her, her camera. She was telling them, she goes, look, she goes, I see orbs and stuff, you know. So she she peeked her phone around the stairwell that goes up to the upper floor. And she peeks it around and she says, and they had a, a voiceover. And she goes, this is how I decide if I sleep upstairs or downstairs at night. And it's by seeing if there are orbs in this and like what it means and how she was pushed and tickled or pinched or something. And I'm thinking (laughs) like, how do these people know any of that? And if you were in a room with people talking about like the sofa being possessed and that they went to this website and that's where they got it and all of this, and you were privy to that conversation, a fly on the wall in that dude, I would seriously be like, there is ether in this house. Something is happening. <laughs> there's there's some some crazy drug dude floating in the air here, right? There's mold or something. <laughs> These people are have lost it. Um, but I definitely wouldn't be following in the trails of what they're saying. Oh, we're going down this rabbit trail. It'd be like, you can go alone, Hancho. I'm out of here. So, do you have any favorite scenes 
Yeah, well, well, the scene, the, the scene I was just talking about is one of them. Right, right, right. You know that scene, but you know, I, I'll say some. There are some scenes that I thought were really good, man. To be honest, I mean, this is like I know we can poke fun and stuff, but there's some stuff I'd say that was good. Like I thought that the way that they did the couch, right, in the way that there were times where the main character would move uh, in the in the house because it eventually gets to Francesca's house, this sofa, okay, the lazy boy. It gets to Francesca's house, the dancer, the interpretive dancer, because she's the main person, right? Not not the people we've been talking about. <laughs> Francesca's the main one, and and this thing is obviously very attracted to her, and you know, even even lays out cookies and stuff, and she thinks it's the boyfriend who may be gay or whatever that did it, and he's very confused about the whole thing. But but they they did a really good job about scenes, for example, where Maxie's outside kind of spooked about what was going on and she looks up into the the apartment which is on like the second floor of a of this house and she looks up and the the uh sofa is looking out the window at her yeah i mean it is hilarious or Uh, the uh staring from the balcony or kick getting the dead body where the sofa is pushing the dead body off of the balcony i think one of my favorites was uh dude the chair blowing out the match every time she lit it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, dude. It'd just go. And she'd light another match because she's trying to set this thing on fire because these are instructions given to her from her from uh Magic the yeah. uh the me- <laughs> rabbi medium guy um uh, per per the website that they're yeah. going to. So uh, yeah, she's trying to burn this thing because mm-hmm. it's covered in gas now, and so is she. I think she got more gas on herself than than the chair. But that was that was uh, one of my favorites. Also, that really perverted guy. For some reason, he goes into her house. He has been filming her, and we don't know this for a while. I couldn't tell what he was doing in there. He's checking her fire alarm. He's checking her what I thought was a modem or something on the floor. I couldn't really tell what that was. Yeah, but he has got a camera set up in there and he's been watching her and she's not home. And he goes in and he takes her bra and a hat and he sets them on her bed and then gets under the covers and I guess humps the hat and bra. Yeah. He's a total pervert. Oh yeah. Yeah. But totally it's, done, perverted. it's yeah. done so awkwardly and so comically, but when he's doing that under the covers and the chair peeks into the room, to see what he's doing, <laughs> yeah. and you know, eventually kills him. But yeah, that was that was one of my favorite scenes too. That was it was, a, it was a funny scene leading up to that because, and th- by the way, that is that's Maxie, the best friend. That's her cousin. Like because oh, they I had to, that. yeah, they had to they had to tell the detective because it was people dying, man. Like this couch yeah. is not messing around. This so not couch. The sofa is not messing around. And so the the detective, they're like, look, there's dead bodies just flying all over the place by this point. And it's really scaring Francesca. I mean, she's totally freaked out by this. Um, at least she was. She starts to get attached because she, you know, she sat on the chair and it got really erotic with her and stuff. And she's like squ- kind of squirming very sexually on this chair and really intense about it and everything and has a deep connection uh, with it. But th- the detectives say, look, you know, of all these names of the men that have been obsessive about you, which ones are the most dangerous? Like which ones? Because they're thinking maybe it's one of the boyfriends in the past, or the guys that liked her that are often other dudes. And and her and Maxie both look at each other and they're like, Ralph or whatever his name is. They're like, yeah, that's that's my cousin. But he goes inside and uh, and you you see him come out of a bathroom and he's he's waving a match in the air. He took the guy took a dump in her house. (laughs) And I was like, are you serious, dude? So like (laughs) it kind of cracked me up. But then when later on, uh, when Francesca comes back. To the place and she realizes this is a de book, you know, and she's going to try to try to get it in this de book box that that was hilarious, a hilarious scene, by the way, with the rabbi guy um, where he uh, he he comes up with this really intense plan on how to deal with this, because once they figure it out and they tell Francesca, she just believes it like there's no doubting grandpa. Right. He's just this guy, Maxie's grandpa. You know, it doesn't matter how crazy it sounds. She's like, OK, I believe it. It's real. And so he uh, he says, well, look, we I've got a plan. It's going to be hard, but this is the plan. And this music is so intense. It, it, it's playing and he's drawing this out. And these are terrible squares like it's very terribly drawn. OK. And he goes, step number one, we have to build a de book box. Step number two, 
We must put the book in the box. And step number three, we have to burn the books in the box. And like, <laughs> and that was it. And it's just these squares, these squiggly squares. Yeah. And then the music stops. Like it's, so she goes to get the, the, the books. She's trying to get it into the box and she's yelling, get in the box. And in the chair, it's funny. The chair goes, no. <laughs> and it was, it was hilarious, man. Like, so yeah. I felt that, I felt that they did good. And I'll say one more really positive thing about it was that, um, you know, and, and I, you know, I'll, I won't even mention the part about the glass in the forehead because that's, it's so bizarre. Oh, like, I was just going to say that yeah. giant piece of glass. Nobody says a word. Yeah, nobody, nobody says a word. And they ask her later, like, are you okay? And they're not even, it, it's, it's bulging out of her head. I mean, yeah. there's a giant shard of glass, massive. Yeah sticking out and maxi um and she's kind of fumbling around and stuff so but no but the one thing i was going to say that was really good and i mentioned this earlier was the um uh, the cinematography right some of it was just brilliant it was it was very good whoever did it was actually quite good and then of course the the big the big twist at the end chad yeah which i thought was pretty cool and a little disturbing <laughs> Uh, you know, we we find out that this Friedrichel guy who was getting his leg cut off at the beginning was actually uh, wanted that to happen so that he could fit inside the chair. Yeah, that was weird. And we do get to see him without a face. He he basically been undead uh, and had been decomposing for weeks. But um, yeah, that, I thought that was actually a pretty cool twist. I didn't see that coming at all. I, I did, thought it was just. Yeah. Some I thought it was just some you know weird voodoo spirit within the chair, and it was. But the fact that there was also a human being in there, you know, animated by whatever, whatever spirit. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, he's got his face ripped off. There's no face, and that yeah, was gross. That was cool. That was yeah. actually pretty. Yeah, yeah. And I I didn't anticipate it either. I didn't anticipate it because I just bought into the line that he was dead. The yeah. guy with his leg cut off. I just figured, you know, like, well, they're they're filling in a lot of bank, a lot of blanks with these info dump type things, mm -hmm. and so I figured, well, there, this is another blank that was just filled in. He's dead, so we don't know why he was dead. We don't know why his leg was cut off. We don't know what the ritual was about, and there's no yeah. indication the way that they did the chair and stuff, like the idea that that Humpty Stumpty was inside there with no legs and stuff so that he would fit <laughs> is, is like, you know, the idea that that's what was going on. And that, um, so the detective figures it out, you know, because they're seeing they're, they're over at homeboy's house. What was it? Ralph's house. Whose house was that? That the detectives, they figure out that somebody has been monitoring. So they go there and they see that there's a video. Yeah. It's yeah. Been it might have been Ralph's house. Ralph's house. Yeah. It had to be Ralph. The so pervert, they, yeah. The pervert. So they figure it out. They they they're at the house, and there's a live feed that's recording every day. It's like a security cam that's recording what's going on, and they see this couch, and they see the fight going on between Francesca and the couch with the gasoline and all that stuff. And they're like, "Whoa, this is bad!" So the detective runs over, and he busts in the door right at the right at the specific point and shoots the the couch. And all of a sudden, the front part, the top part of the couch, because the couch stood up all the or the the chair stood up all the way, right. Yeah. And it starts moving like real slowly toward it. So it's, it's, it's standing upright. Which, and, you know, I thought I felt was done really well because the sound effects that they use for that uh, made it be all that much cooler. I mean, it's so absurd that this couch is like uh, just turned into a biped thing that's coming at her. And but the the, the sound effects made it uh, really were good. Cool. They were good, actually. It, it, it was convincing almost like. It was, it was, the face was convincing. The eyes were convincing. The way that the cushions, they kind of would manipulate the shape of the cushions to make it look adorable. Yeah. Like it was kind of this childlike innocence to it, or that mm -hmm. it was mad, or that it was, yeah. you know, kind of daunting and stuff. And so they really did a great subtle. job. It was subtle, mm -hmm. yes. And they did a good job with the bottom crease the, to make the mouth look like it was either a little bit grumpy. So it was never dramatic. You know, you yeah. never saw like a huge smile on, on the, the sofa. No. So, but he gets the sofa gets shot, and all of a sudden, you know, and you don't know what's going to happen. Like this is possessed. I mean, what, what's it going to do? You know, yeah. you're, you're shooting a, a spirit. Okay, so he shoots the the sofa, and the top half of the the lazy boy falls forward, and there's a body in it. 
and his and, hand, hands shoved through the springs. His hands, yes, his hands are <laughs> through the springs, and his his little stumpy legs are in the 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 bottom part. And so this dude and his face was ripped off, like it was so grody looking. It was, I mean, it was pretty gross, man. That it was that gone, scene, yeah, yeah, it was it uh, totally gone. And it's funny, we have to say this: the the way the way that the detective figured a lot of this out and started giving hints that you're like, wait a second, man, is that guy alive? Like, is is the guy in the beginning? Is that somehow they figure out they they connect it with the the man who cut off the leg? <laughs> <laughs> they inter- they interrogate him. Yeah, they interrogate him and c- come yeah. to find out, he's like, "Look, why would you do that?" And he's like, "I don't know." He's like, "The guy told me, you know, he, he was doing it willingly and that he wasn't going to sue me, and and he's still alive. It's okay." And he's like, "But you're only a veterinarian. You're not a surgeon." <laughs> <laughs> you're like, "What is this about?" Kind of thing, you know. And uh, and so that was a hilarious scene. And one more man, I forgot about, and I I even drew it. I have a drawing. Maybe I'll share it on our Facebook page. People can find us at Paleo Cheese on Facebook. But I have I, I I drew a picture of the uh, there the the boyfriend the guy who was you know causing all these major problems and stuff. This guy, uh, what is it, Fred Rico? Is that the dude's name? The stumpy guy. Yeah. So Fred Rico, you know, he was really obsessed, and he he made these voodoo dolls <laughs> of 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 uh, Francesca. He made these voodoo dolls of her. And I, I drew it out because it was so funny. He's got this voodoo doll that's got her, her face on it. He's got two of them, actually. But the first one, it has her face on the doll. And then on the 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 right shoulder, it says, burn in hell, on the right arm. On the left arm, it says, early impotence. <laughs> then you've got the right leg is toothache. And then the left leg is serial lethargy. And I'm just like, and so he's he's got it, like, written out. All this stuff, and then the second one, it's another doll, but it's got the pin through it, and it's kind of like laid out to the side. And it's just, it's so funny to see the image of this. And so, and you all, you kind of find a lot out at the end, which is a criticism because I felt like it accelerated so fast and that it, yeah. it became funnier, not only in how absurd it was, but the frequency of the absurdities. We're we're cycling through real quickly for the last twenty minutes, and I felt that compared to the rest of the film, the rest of the film had things that were absurd or silly or not very well acted that kind of made it funny, you know, and that that it was way way more at the end, and it was off balance, if that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Okay, we've talked a lot about like this, our favorite scenes, and uh, you know, gave a lot of detail on the movie and everything. Mm-hmm. But like overall, my 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 feeling, I, I mean, there's a lot to criticize for sure. But I mean, I knew going in what to expect. But w- w- something that I wasn't expecting was the how good the cinematography was, mm-hmm. and just how good the lighting was in particular. The colors, blue and red particularly blue especially in the first like third of the movie made some really really cool moody shots um really done well it reminded me very i know you're probably not familiar with uh dario argento italian filmmaker who did suspiria but he used color like that a lot and particularly suspiria using like blue and red and it really reminded me a lot of that and and that part of it was really impressive to me but at the end of it all the the movie is a little confusing because while it is a low budget absurd film it's made better than that yeah. so it makes for this weird confusing ball of of you know nonsense that doesn't look like your average you know it's above par in quality when compared to like a trauma film or any kind of something like Velasa Pastor, or at least what we saw from the trailer, but just that kind of like uh, the quality and film that they use, you know, a lot of those old films, they got that like porn film quality to it. <laughs> this, the, 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 whatever film or cameras that they were using for this uh, were, were much better. The acting yeah. wasn't, the acting wasn't, um, you know, wasn't very good, but it wasn't that bad either for some of the for some of the characters anyway yeah and it had some i think some of the humor was probably like a new zealand thing this is this is a new zealand film right and um 
but overall i enjoyed it for for what it was and i i would give it i mean it's not something i'm like you know hey man you gotta watch this unless it's a friend of mine who i know this is their thing they love to sit and laugh at stupid movies Mm -hmm. um then i would be like oh well if that's your thing you need to check out killer sofa so i i would give it i would give it three stars but three out of five a three out of five yep three out of five yeah 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 um, but unless it's somebody that that uh, you know isn't in that kind of thing, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell anybody to watch it. Right. I'm I, I'm with you on it actually because I I went to IMDb and I I rated that bad boy. Mm. I, I try I try to be fair, man. You know, I I went on there and it was like a three point five, and I thought that's that's garbage, man. Like you know, if people, you know, anyone three point like, five out of ten. Out of 10, yeah. yeah. The 3.5, that's why I was trying to be clear about, you know, because right. if somebody hears, you know, uh, we have a 3, and then they go and they're like, oh, a 3.5, so no, no, it would be a 6 on IMDb, right? And I, that's what I gave yeah. them. I gave them a 6, and I said, look, mm-hmm. I it was entertaining. I It was funnier than I thought. There were There was bad acting, but I anticipated it. I but I was taken off guard by how good some of the cinematography was and the lighting and all that. Like I was, that was a pleasant surprise. Yeah, almost disorienting because I was I was not expecting that. Yeah, and and the story was funny, you know, and it was it was the the sound effects were great, and the only thing that I would say was weak, you know, because I'll even I'll even wink and, and stuff at the uh, at the acting because that kind of goes with the territory a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. Although there was some that I would say were worse than even what you know maybe they shouldn't have been on there. But the um, the writing, I felt that there were certain parts of the writing that even for that it, it, they could have done a little bit better. You know, and not maybe done so many leaps where you have to do so much info dump type stuff. Yeah. Um. So I felt that some of that, or you know, why why talk about the dad of the the rabbi guy? Like, what what's the yeah. point of that? There was it was an une it was no need for that. Yeah. And so there were some things in there that could have been taken out, and maybe a couple things that could maybe could have been put in to make it a little bit more coherent. But at the same time, I enjoyed it. I watched the whole thing. I was entertained. I laughed. There was a suspense scene at the at the window in the bathroom that was actually suspenseful to me. I was like, whoa, man, what's going to happen? I didn't know what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. And in the end, it resulted in uh, Maxie having a huge glass shard in her head. Right. And yeah. so it was but that suspense scene, you know, and, and it kind of ends in a way that's that's suspenseful. Even you don't know what's going to happen to her. Yeah. And so I thought that was really great. And the sound effects were great. And the sofa was was the real showstopper. The, the sofa is the winner of it all because the sofa was so it was compelling. Mm-hmm. It was a compelling sofa that you your suspended disbelief with the sofa that the sofa is peeking around the corner, man. <laughs> like the sofa is peeking down, look, looking through the window and stuff and looking down over the balcony at you. And it was you know, that suspended disbelief where you look and you, you think, man, look at what sofa's doing. And you're not thinking, Oh man, that's kind of neat. Look how they prop that thing up there. You know, that it really was believable in the moment watching that. And it was a surprise twist that twist at the end to realize that the man who got his leg chopped off, got his legs chopped off so that he could fit his stumps into the sofa. Yeah. In in hindsight, that's actually creepy to think that this, yeah. Thing that's been creeping around is a is a guy who deliberately chopped his his uh, legs off so that he could fit inside here and creep around and kill people so that yeah. uh, this whole love thing can uh, <laughs> manifest, which is kind of was was kind of silly, but like the very very end, it, it definitely warranted a six. Like without that's I have no hesitation in saying six out of ten or three out of five. There you go. So, you know, we we do this pretty regularly, Chad, like at the end of the show. But what lesson, man, if you could take any kind of moral insight, anything that you gleaned from this to make you a better man, more more uh, wise and prudent, even in your decision making in life, what would that be? I think if I if I came home from work or whatever, I came home and my house smelled like sulfur. 
some pervert has just pooped in my house and I should probably run. <laughs> if it smells like a burned match. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Dude, it was an awesome show. It was a cool it was. movie. It, it was, was an awesome show. We talked. We had a great time. It's a bummer. It's over, man. It always bums me out. We should mention Killer Sofa is streaming on Amazon Prime. That's how we watched it. And you can see the trailer on YouTube. Yes. And so please go check it out. Find us on social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and email us all of these at Paleo Cheese. P-A-L-E-O-C-H-E-E-Z-E. And you can find us at all those places at Paleo Cheese, as well as iTunes and everything else. We look forward to getting emails from everybody and from uh, comments and likes and all that. We can't wait to come back, man. It's like becoming quickly a highlight of my week, Chad. Certainly. Yes, man. Yeah. Love watching movies, talking about them with you, pointing and laughing, or even, you know, just really diving deep, man, into some underlying stuff that, that isn't right there on the surface under in, in the spotlight. Yeah. Dude, it's only going to get better, man. It's a good time. And we want to thank again one more time. We want to thank Project Entertainment Network for having us on board. It's a big honor. It's a real privilege. And we look forward to getting to know more of the personalities and podcasts that are with that project and uh and until next time everybody i'm jeremiah bannister and i'm chad lutsky and you've been listening to paleo cheese podcast dead sexy podcasts i'm your host armand rosamilia fridays exclusively on project entertainment network where i interview authors publishers editors artists filmmakers narrators the lady from walmart Whoever I feel like talking to. That's every Friday, Armcast, right here on Project Entertainment Network.